Well, our guests now know what it's like to do the hard yards in pursuit of their goals. But their success wasn't measured in yards, rather it was in completing 800 kilometres of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Fergus Grady co-directed the film Camino Skies that documents the journey made by six pilgrims, we call them, their personal pilgrims rather than religious ones, from New Zealand and from Australia, each with deeply personal reasons for walking the Camino, which is also known as the Way of St James. Two of them are Terry Wilson, who's in the Auckland studio. Good morning, Terry. Good morning. And his son-in-law, Mark Thompson, who's here in Wellington with me. Morning, Mark. Yeah, morning. Terry convinced Mark to walk the Camino after Mark's daughter Maddie, who had cystic fibrosis, died at the age of 17. Terry had already walked the Camino himself, reflecting upon what had happened to the family and on his precious granddaughter. Production of the film took place over 42 days in Spain, where the crew walked the entire way with the cast, carrying their own gear. Fergus as we said, is the co-director. He's in Auckland also, along with Terry. Hi, Fergus. Good to be with you, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks, all of you, for coming. And can I say, I've done several stories on the Camino, and this one is my favourite. I think you really captured the essence of what these people were doing, Fergus. And thanks, all of you, for coming and to talk to us about it. Terry, you're a Camino veteran almost, aren't you? Oh, uh. Sometimes people say that, but you have to realise that many people have walked it 10, 15 times. So there's a lot of uh, lot of big walkers out there. You've done it three, I think. Uh, I've done it three, yes. Why did you go the first time? Well, the first time I went for, for myself, um, something in life and had changed, and I decided I really want to get things right. And then three months later, our granddaughter... They died of cystic fibrosis, and I decided to do it for her as well. We ran a bit of a faith, uh, give a little page, and uh, I did it for her, but at the same time I did it for myself, and that's pretty important to say. What did you get out of it that made you want to go back again? It is totally addictive. Um, many people online forums relate to the fact that when you get back, uh, you know, after the initial, I'm never doing this again, that takes about a month. But after that, you feel listless, you don't know what to do, um, you don't feel as happy as you were when you were walking through Spain, um, drinking red wines at one euro, um, you know, eating tortilla. Um, it's not a bad life. And, you know, it's addictive. You just want to keep going back and back and back. And that's why my wife has hidden my passport. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you first learn about the Camino? Because there's lots of places you can walk. You could have gone and yeah. walked, I don't know, the Californian coastline. You that's could have right. done to Araroa. Where did you first learn about the Camino? I learned about it from the alternative film that's nowhere near as good as ours, obviously, <laughs> called The Way. Um, and by the time, pardon me, by the time I'd finished watching it, I was very emotional, and I said to myself, you know, you're going to go and you're going to walk it the way of St. James, and you're going to do the whole 800 kilometres. And I just decided that that was it, and I said to my wife the next morning, um, I ran it past her, and she said, well, if that's what you want to do, go and do it. And so I did. And I've done it again and again. Hmm. And when I find my passport, I'll do it again. <laughs> we, can, we can think of pilgrimage being many things, and it can be many things even to one person. Yep. What is it to you? Let's liken the Camino to an 800 kilometre long washing machine. And it's got buttons on it for physical, mental, spiritual. And then you can have a heavy wash or a light wash or whatever. And so many people just go for the physical button. I went for all three, physical, mental, spiritual as well. And it sucks you in, agitates you, covers you in fluffy buttons, and then tips you out 35-day cycle, tips you out 35 days later, all clean. Um, and that, to me, is what it did for me. Physically demanding? Oh, gut-bustingly hard. 
but you can do it. And lots of people older than me. I sat outside a um, hostel on the last trip, moaning my little bottom off about how hard it was that day and saying that for a 70 year old like me, and a little old lady leaned over my shoulder and said, Sonny, I'm 83. And on the trip that we did for Camino Skies, we came across a 92 year old. Mentally challenging. Absolutely. Many of the walkers on the Camino are quite professional people in walking. And they all say that this is one of the hardest walks mentally. You have to get up in the morning and walk more than half a marathon every day for about 35, 38 days. On the mental and on the emotional front, is it a little bit like counselling? For those of you who are carrying grief and yep. in different ways, just about everybody in the documentary was, I mean, yep. just about everyone in life is, but, but That's right. quite acute uh, and recent in, in the instances of some of those in the documentary. Yes. A bit like counselling, is there a moment where it hurts before it helps? And are there oh, days where you are stuck absolutely. confronting things? Absolutely. On my first Camino, I, I, out of the, I did it in 35 days. And I spent 20 days crying. And, you know, you eventually cry yourself out. People will rock up alongside you walking. You've never met them in your life. They'll slow down. And with a Bond Camino, which is enjoy your Camino, they'll slow up enough and walk with you for, say, half an hour, an hour. They may dump their life's problems on you. And then once they've done that, often they'll say, Bond Camino, and leap from their stride and walk off into the sunset. You may never see them again. But you do that to somebody else as well. You seem to be all... Most people on it are receptive to sharing their problems. Now, you couldn't go down Queen Street in Auckland and do that, could you? You talk on the doco. you get arrested? <laughs> you talk on the doco about the three stages, and there's one middle stage that everyone seemed to be struggling with a bit that's kind of flat and almost a bit boring compared yeah. to the rest. Yeah. And is well, that where there's nothing to do, perhaps, but think about whatever it is you've come to either not think about or to think about? Yes, the Masetta, it's a high plane, about 900 metres high, but it's, it's quite flat. But what you've got to realise is there is no flat in Spain. It's either all the way up or all the way down. Um, even on the flat, you know, there is some challenging moments. But it is, um, it's conducive to thinking. You'll be walking down a dirt road with vineyards on the other one side, um, and a crop of some description or somebody tending his sheep on the other side. Um, you may see a village way in the future. That sort of picture that you walk through is very conducive to getting some real thoughts going in your head. When did you think of Mark and how did you broach with Mark that he well, might want to do it? Well, that's interesting and I'd like to compliment Mark on something that he asked me, I didn't ask him, and that's very brave. He seemed to think, silly man, that the Camino had done something for me. And when he heard that I was going back again, he said, I'd like to walk it as well. And I'm so proud of that. That's good going. What made you ask, Mark? Yeah, I could just see something in Terry when he got back, you know, before he left, he was a Bit of a grumpy old bugger, and hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and um, still a great father-in-law. But um, you know, I just saw something that that it had changed him. He had, you know, released a lot of grief from Maddie, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, I was like, I want some of that. I, I saw it and I wanted it, and yeah, it made me draw up the courage to ask the wife if I could go, which I thought would be met with much scepticism, but. Um, she totally encouraged me and, yeah, said that would be the most amazing thing ever. So. What was it you were looking to have happen? Because you're deep in grief. You're never going to just chuck off your grief, right? But you obviously wanted to carry it differently or, or to, to get somewhere. So how would you describe before you went where you were at? I mean, I was just your typical Kiwi bloke that, you know, we don't deal very well with grief. We bottle it all up and don't let it out at all. 
and I saw it as an opportunity after seeing what it done for Terry that yeah I could go over there and and find some answers find if Maddie was okay up there look for um, a moment where I could release some of the grief that I had bottled up inside of me and I'll tell you there's no better place in the world to do it than on the Camino because as Terry said you can walk with people day after day after day and talk to different people and it's just releasing all that bottled up grief that was inside that there's no way I ever would have got rid of in New Zealand. So what did you experience from, from I mean, it's a, it's a physically demanding, anyone who's starting off on a long walk straight away, there's going to be pain and blisters and aches and pains. What, what did you experience in the early days? Yeah, I don't want to ruin the film too much, but um, like on day two, there was the dog scene and and I, I love that. And, and it showed me that Maddie was up there looking after me and, and that was enough for me to realise. And then later on in the movie, I talked just briefly about the night in the Bates Motel. <laughs> well, the Bates Motel was a funny old place. The dog, um, day two, was my, one of my worst days. It was horrible, rain, wet, everything. Um, this day was about halfway through and it was raining, sleeting, cold, miserable. And I got to the accommodation where Phoebe had booked us in for the night and got there and I was first one to arrive. Um, and the people looked up my name and says, no, they didn't speak English. And, and no, 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 I said, what? And, and as it turned out when Phoebe did arrive, that nine of us were booked in and she cancelled the top three names because three Spanish pilgrims had come in and she wanted to give them a bed rather than us. So I was kicked out back out into the rain and sleep, freezing cold, and I had to wait for everyone else to turn up to get it all sorted out. So that was a horrible night, and then they were not very nice people all night long, and and yeah, it just it was a really bad day. But the next day it woke up, beautiful sunshine, me and Terry walked off, had the most amazing breakfast at the next village down the road with bacon, sausages, eggs, everything that you can't get. And I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, well, look, maybe Maddie had a day off yesterday. <laughs> and um, I was talking to my wife later on and she said, well, actually, uh, yeah, because while I was in Spain, my house, at, my, my wife sold my house in Paito, bought a new house in Palmerston North and the kids were starting school in a new school in Milson that day. And that was the same day that I had the bad day. And when she took the kids to school, there was a huge big rainbow over the school which, and it was a beautiful day, there was a rainbow there, and that's our sign for Maddie, is a rainbow. So then I realised that, no, Maddie was too busy looking after her little brother and sister to worry about me that day, she couldn't look after all of us, so she was over there looking after them, and I got left behind. But then she came back to me the next day, so this just another about, sign. This is about carrying her with you through life, isn't it? Definitely. It's, it's about, Definitely. It's about uh, and it's, it's literally learning to walk. With, with who yep. and, and what's happened. And the dog, and I don't want to give away too much either, but, I mean, people should just watch this, so don't worry about it. Nothing can match the characters we meet. <laughs> Nothing that we do today can match the characters that we meet. But the dog was quite literally when you were at a low, low point in the middle of nowhere looking at a hill and going, there's no way I'm going up there. And you were turning around looking at the <laughs> looking back going backwards. And out of nowhere, a companion turns up and gets you up that hill. Yeah, yeah, that is totally unbelievable. You also made friends with another of the walkers, or had a, or had a chat with her, um, Julie uh, Zarifa. And, and goodness, any I remember, I don't know Julie, yet, but I remember reading this story, very well known Christchurch family, um, reading what happened within 16 days, I think, losing her husband and then losing her son in an accident. I recall reading that in the newspaper and just going, oh my God. And now on this documentary, we get to meet this amazing, amazing woman. Yep. But is that something else? And, in, in silence and without going into enormous detail, just a fellow traveller in the, in the massiveness of what you're experiencing, just being around someone else and swapping a few conversations, empowering as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Judy was going through a very, very hard time and, and it was good to have someone there that, knew what I felt, and I knew what she felt. And yeah, we, I suppose we did click in a way that, yeah, we, we knew each other before we didn't know each other, if you know what I mean. And it was really good to have that person with you. And, of course, I had Terry as well, who'd gone through everything that I'd gone through. But 
I mean, yeah, when you see it on the movie and the stories come out, I mean, there's no comparison between the A or B or anything like that. We all struggled with our own grief and, and everything like that. But, I mean, she's an incredible woman to go through what she went through. But often it's what's not said or the short observations that are powerful. It's not like a massive group therapy, thing, you know. No, it's just, no, definitely not. Again, it's just walking, literally walking alongside. Yep. And, and was that, um, I, mean, I don't know if it had any impact on you really, but even just knowing someone else out there gets it, um, part of it. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it wasn't only people in our group like Julie. It was people from all around the world. I mean, I met a German, walked with him for a day, a German guy, Michael, I think his name was. Who, um, whose wife had died at birth to their daughter. And her daughter, his daughter was now seven years old and he'd never left her side in that seven years. And this was the first time that he had left her alone with his parents. And he was walking for the same amount as us, you know, like 40 days. And, and he was just heartbroken. But you could see it healing him as well. And, and it just does that to all people around the world. Ours was lucky enough to be caught on film, I suppose. To each of you, Terry and Mark, is there something about walking while mentally and emotionally processing that is powerful, as opposed to sitting on a couch somewhere, or I don't know, is there something about the, the physical activity? Definitely, yeah. yeah. For you, yeah. first, Mark? Yeah, I mean, and I, and I confess I was a couch potato before I got up and done this, you know. I did a lot of training to get onto this walk and, and even when I was trained to walk, um, it was, yeah, it was just that opportunity to think and your mind's just going at a thousand miles an hour the whole time that you're walking and and it's good, you, you, you just lots and lots of thought processes going through your head about how I could have done things better, what I could have, you know, sort of said to Maddie and things like that, but uh, it's just a great time to reflect. And to do it while you're walking and suffering, it's many situations. But yeah, it was it was a perfect perfect way to do it. And Terry, for you, the walking aspect of it, I think, helps you think. It it gives you something to do with your arms, your leg, and your body, while the mind is away uh, thinking of other things. And I think some of the well, some, just about every day was physically challenging. Some of them were up to 30 kilometres. A couple of the walking days were 18 kilometres, and, you know, when you get one of those, it's like going next door for a cup of sugar sort of thing. You think, oh, well, what'll I do, you know, after lunch? It's really physically hard, and you, I think you do your best thinking when you're physically exhausted. Um, yeah, it's just, it's one of those places that, does everything for you. It physically exhausts you, but your brain is still working, thinking. And, yeah. I think I wonder too if there's something the nervous system registers that you're literally putting one foot in front of the other, so everything must be all right. Does, does that make sense? Like I, you're doing some hard, hard stuff, but yeah. but the physical almost calms things. Yes, yeah, definitely. It's uh, you become a machine. You you just in the end you just get up in the morning, and you tell your legs you're going that way, and away they go. And the rest of you can sort of mentally and spiritually have a holiday. You know, you, the the legs of your car, and you can just ride on them, and away you go. And you can just go wherever you like. You can think about Maddie, cry about Maddie, whatever. It's our guests are Terry Wilson and Mark Thompson. We're talking about them. They were two of the New Zealanders featured in the film Camino Skies that documents uh, the, the journey, the 800-kilometre walk of the Camino de Santiago in Spain, 26 minutes past 10. You're listening to 9 to Noon on RNZ National. Also with us, Fergus Grady, who co-directed uh, the film. Fergus, how did you persuade these people to put themselves at this very personal time in front of your camera and up on the screen? Uh, well, it was funny. I, I heard about Terry uh, through a Manor Two Standard uh, newspaper article and uh, contacted the journalist. Um, Terry, the, when he replied to my email, came down the next day to Wellington and we had a coffee. Um, I think within half an hour he, he, he was ready to get that passport back and, and jump on, on the next flight. Um, but 
he did say, well, let me call you tomorrow, and I think he must have spoken to Mark. Mark must have spoken to Angela, and then it all came back, and uh, we had two for the price of one. So um, they, they were the, the only gentlemen in the film, um, and there were four ladies, uh, two from Australia and two from New Zealand. How did you find them? Well, let's just speak about Julie, because I think she is, uh, as Mark said, a remarkable lady. We, um, we wanted someone from the South Island, and uh, we were speaking with a few travel agents about partnering on, you know, helping us finance the film, because we solely financed the film from our own savings. But uh, Julie uh, was interested in the Camino and had reached out to a travel company, and um, they, they'd heard about uh, Paul's passing. So I was actually in, in Christchurch for a wedding, and um, I met Julie the day after Paul passed away, um, and, and we sat down for a coffee, and... Uh, and I was uh, kind of unprepared for what what she was sort of uh, her mental mental state, but she was very very keen to to get away from Christchurch and, and get over to the Camino. Um, and then two weeks later, um, Sam passed away. Did you give her advice at that point, or did you say, "Look, hey, um, no need to participate, given what's happened"? What 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 was your what was your communication? It was difficult. Um, I didn't know how to react. I've, I've been fortunate enough to not have that much grief in my life. So I, I, I can't really um, position myself in her shoes or empathise with what her, her situation. But um, Noel, my co-director, who's based in Melbourne, and I just basically said, take your time. We, we don't need to hear back from you. If you don't want to come, it's not the end of the world. And she, at that point, I think she'd already booked a flight, so she wasn't backing out. She's one of these remarkable characters. Another is the Australian uh, Sue Morris, uh, who has a different, a different sort of um, story to tell in a way. Although there's some clearly some some grief in in, in her life um, that is very gently revealed. Um, love as much as grief, and they always go together, don't they? Mm. Uh, but hers were the physical challenges that that she was going into this with how did you meet sue i met sue um i had sort of when i started researching the film you know joined a few facebook groups and sue was the moderator of the australian pilgrims um, on the camino facebook page which has got a pretty strong following in australia and i'd been in touch and uh i found out that she had walked it twice but never really completed the the french camino i mean she had caught the bus and taxi and then had, had had bad injury on the second Camino. So I was trying to needle away and convince her that she could finish it at the age of 70. Um, and, and little did I know, because I hadn't met her, was that she had some serious health issues um, but had kept them under wraps um, until he basically walked uh, along on the first week and uh, the amount of painkillers that she was taking, um, I was I was seriously worried that Noel and I would be checking in, her into rehab for painkiller addiction at the end. Um, <laughs> but uh, she is one of the most dogged, determined women I've ever met in my life. She's and extremely funny. Very, very funny. I mean, yeah. all these guys are funny. I've, I've had the most incredible week with Terry um, and we've been able to fly over our production coordinator Phoebe from the UK um, and we've been travelling around the, around the South Island, North Island taking the film to the, to the regions and uh, Terry honestly is, is a stand up comedian um, in waiting, I mean he has audiences and raptures and, and laughter at every Q&A that we do So um, and Sue is the same so we're releasing the film in, in Australia in August so Sue will be doing the same thing with Noel what made you want to make the film? Well, I've always wanted to make um, a feature documentary and we, Noel and I, have been working together for eight years and have put together multiple you know, treatments and ideas and submitted funding applications, but with no luck. We wanted to make something that we could finance or, or pay for out of our own pocket that would be a contained journey film so we wouldn't necessarily need to go... Um, you know, on for years following subjects. So a 40-day walk with the completion at the end and the final act sort of pre-written. Um, and, and, and then we came back and, and realised that we had not only one film but about 70 films because we'd shot about 150 hours. And that's when the real journey started for us as filmmakers. You wouldn't have seen many of or necessarily witnessed many of the things that eventually came to represent these walkers' stories. 
And was that the real challenge, the little moments that captured what they were experiencing? Yeah, I mean, we, we shot sort of six to eight hours a day, um, but at the end of the whole thing, there were four or five scenes that Noel and I knew would build our timeline or our narrative around. And it was just about tying up everyone's sort of narrative threads um, in the in the end. But as we've mentioned, that dog scene is, is remarkable. And that was, that was out of pure luck um, because with how we, you know, went about production every day, Noel would often start with me. I, I, I was the sound recorder, so Noel was the cinematographer. And we would mic two, two of the cast up every day and follow them until they got sick of us, you know, slowing them down. But I would often walk along with the subjects for the day and Noel would drop back and film, you know, some of the beautiful shots that are in the film. Uh, on that day too that Mark's talked about, Noel dropped back and uh, was by himself when Mark experienced the dog. Um, and, and then later on, Noel found the dog too and, and started filming the dog. And there's sort of this incredible point of view, um, you know. So it's the sequence. actual dog in the film. It's the actual dog in the <laughs> film. <It's> so <laughs> you'll never forget it. Yeah. No. Yeah. So yeah. What changed when you got back, Mark? Like what? You're, you, we can see you getting leaner over the course of the film, by the way. Um, and, and, <laughs> um, if I may say so kindly, um, getting getting fitter. And but what's different now? A few months on, over a year on, I think. What's different? Um, yeah, it's hard because, like Terry, I mean, I'd go back in a second to do it again, but right. I mean, I've, you're wrong. <laughs> you got to find your passport it's two first. passports that are going to go. Yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, I mean, a lot of my grief has, has disappeared, and, and I know that Maddie's in a, in a nice place where she's happy, she's still looking down on us, looking after us, and... And that's very, very comforting that that she is in a good place. Um, but also, I mean, I've got her two younger siblings now, Mitchell and Alexa. You know, I, I've, I wasn't probably much of a father to them before I left, but now it's good to... What? To be there. I was Sorry, what was that? No, no. I said what? Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it makes me treasure my two children now even more. And my wife as well, what an amazing job she did while I was away, you know, buying a house, selling a house, moving our house, all that she had to do by herself while I was off gallivanting around the world. So, yeah, I mean, it's good to, like I say, know Maddie's okay, look after my children and be a better father. So It's like you're moving again, moving yeah. forward again. Yeah, I'm yeah. off the couch. Yeah. <laughs> And Terry, is there any point in asking you? Um, it's just, <laughs> it really is becoming something of an addiction. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. There are people yeah. who go back every year, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. But a lot of people that go back every year only have to spend 50 euros on a flight from the UK um, or within Europe. And we have to spend, you know, two and a half thousand New Zealand dollars to get back over there. But, so there is a bit of a difference there. And a lot of people walk some of it and then go back and then walk another bit and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, let's clear up something Mark said. You are a wonderful father and you always have been to Hey, look, they're here. There's, 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 one of them's going to be a radio producer at least, except I think she's going to be a vet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, they're here right now with Dad, so um, uh, you're on duty this week. Okay, it's school holiday duty. School holidays. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Fergus, what happens now with the film? Um, you're, you've already had a lot of uh, positive feedback. Who's seen it and, and where does it go from here? Yeah, we've had a, um, an amazing run on the festival circuit. We took the film to Newport Beach in California and, um, and the Americans just loved it and we're hoping to take it back later in the year. But before that, um, we opened yesterday on 25 cinemas around the country. Um, so there should be a cinema to, to a close proximity to your listeners um, and if not, get people to ring the cinema and ask for it to be put on um, and then um, after that we'll be in Australia and, and we're just in discussions about the UK at the moment so it's very exciting as first time filmmakers to have this um, positive experience um, first up. Well well done because I said I've read many books and seen many things about the Camino but this, this is actually getting inside the people and the people's 
journeys, which is its point, and you've done an amazing job of it. Thanks all of you for coming in. Drive them down, Mark. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. No Thanks Thank very, very much. much. Terry Wilson and Mark Thompson and Fergus Grady, and there's a link through to uh, more information about Camino Skies on our webpage.